So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Ross Bapu. Ross has been in the industry for 35 years and with RCF for the past 23, where he's served in various capacities, including head of private equity. During his tenure, RCF has invested in over 200 mining projects in 50 countries across 30 different commodities. Ro Ro oh, sorry. <laughs> Sonia Scarcelli, Sonia leads BHP's metal exploration division, as well as the mineral exploration accelerator, BHP Explore, and is focused on creating transformative and collaborative approaches to further BHP's future growth options. Rotesh Dewan, president and CEO of ICMM, which brings together 24 of the world's largest mining and metal companies in a mission to raise a standard of responsible mining. And lastly, Mark Kutfani, industry veteran of 47 years with 18 years as chief executive, retired from Anglo-American in 2022, and now chair of volley-based metals with a range of other industrial and NGO advisory and directorship roles. Thank you all for attending. We'll have time at the end for some Q&A, uh, but uh, we'll start things right off with, with Mark. So Mark, you're considered to be one of the most influential mining leaders within our industry. You've been an advocate for change and education of the general public about what we do and how we help make it work better. How do you think the perception of mining is affecting our ability to attract more graduates to the industry? And what strategies should we be employing to attract those, those graduates and educate the wider population. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, and it's great to be here, and great to be here with the panel members. Um, next to me on my left is my current coach on uh, um, how to connect with people in a very different way in the industry. And if I could make uh, an observation on an experience I went through recently to help answer the question. Myself and a colleague, Tim Biggs, uh, were involved with uh, Exeter and the Camborne School of Mines uh, regarding the attitude of the student union to the mining industry, where they were saying we shouldn't allow mining companies to be involved in sponsorship of the university. And we had a two-hour discussion, and Tim did a fantastic job talking about mining's role in society. And I won't go through those points. I think people are aware of those points and happy to pick it up during the course of the conversation. But the things I picked up from that conversation included, and, and I, I made a list, and I'll come back to the final point, industry leadership and broader management cohort are not trusted by society, and Roe often quotes the Globescan reports uh, and analysis of our perception uh, as supporting that. Reports and observers such as Globespan have said that we've deteriorated in the last 10 years despite our efforts. Safety and health issues raise concerns for those that aren't aware of our broadened uh, broader improvement in uh, performance, community engagement, impact on social groups plays into that negative perception. <laughs> Old fashioned and low technology, and we heard some of those comments a little bit earlier. Dirty and not environmentally responsible people, uh, responsible. people tend not to connect with us on the basis of the perceptions of our role and what we do and the, and the impact we have. Um, remote sites not conveniently located in areas and communities of interest. So for some it's an adventure, for some it's a, it's, um, a negative. And the lack of awareness on breadth of career opportunities and personal development opportunities is interesting. At IMARC a few weeks back we had 200 students go through all the stands at, the, at uh, IMARC and about 90% of the, 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 the young people said they wouldn't consider a career in mining before they went through and had a look at all the opportunities. And almost 100% went the other way and said, at the end of it, we would consider because we hadn't realised what you do, the scope of uh, the opportunities in the industry. And in learning from Rowe, I talked about a thing I went through a few nights ago. I was at a, a session, the, the uh, Arise Foundation, anti-slavery, and the chair, we introduced myself, she said, well, what do you do? And the response I get when I say I'm from the mining industry is usually fairly negative, so I tried something a little bit different. I said, look, I work for an industry that has the most significant, positive, net environmental impact on the face of the planet. And I said, can you guess who I work for or what industry I work in? And she said, 
uh, no idea. And I said, it's the mining industry. And I think she was about to choke. <laughs> <laughs> However, she said, how do you get to that net positive outcome? For the next 10 minutes, we talked about the industry and it was because she asked. Your point, don't lecture. It's better if people are asking you and wanting to engage in the conversation. And I also talked about at ABMEC, we should stop calling ourselves the mining or the extractive sector, sounding like a trip to the dentist. What people don't realise is that we provide the raw materials for everything. You don't create matter. You extract those minerals, the dentist story, from the earth. So how do we help people understand what we do and engage them in a conversation around the contributions we make and also how we could do it better? And I think that captures the points I'd like to make. Mm. Most definitely does. Thank you very much. Ro, the mining industry underpins nearly half of all the global economic activity, meaning the level of positive influence, as Mark was suggesting, can wield a greater, you know, greater than any other industry. What impact do you believe the state of diversity, equity, inclusion in mining has on the attractiveness of young graduates to the sector? Look, thank you for convening this important conversation, but it is a little bit ironic to have a set of boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials talking about young people in mining. <laughs> it's already come up once before this morning, but if we're going to have a conversation about young people in mining, it would be helpful to have at least one up on stage next time. On the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, let me answer it by telling you something you don't expect me to talk about, which is rugby. And I'm not expecting anybody here to be a rugby fan. But it's just to tell you that I come from a country, South Africa, where rugby was considered the sport of the oppressor. You know, black and brown people never supported the Springboks because it was seen as a white sport. And I can't tell you how much seeing Sia Colisi, our first black rugby captain, lift the World Cup, not once, but twice in a row. And sorry to all the Kiwis and English fans in the room. And Aussies. And Aussies. <laughs> you were a bit behind. <laughs> Only a bit. <laughs> to see the hands of a black captain on the rugby trophy has done more to inspire hope in that country than anything else that has happened since apartheid ended nearly 30 years ago. Why do I tell you that? I tell you that because for the last 30 years, until Sia lifted that trophy, you could have been telling black and brown kids, you know what, in this country, you can be whoever you want to be. You can be the captain of the Springboks, and nobody would have believed you because they couldn't see somebody that looked like them in the position you were telling them they could have achieved. So imagine us now saying to young kids, especially women or people from ethnic minorities, that you can be a mining executive. And then they look at the boards of mining, of mining companies and the executive teams and they see nobody that looks like them. Sonia, until recently, nobody that looked like you would be in the position that Thank you're you in. Saying that. But actually, your company has done more to change diversity and inclusion in our industry than arguably any other, because BHP's percentage of women in their workforce is double the industry's average. The industry average is 17% of women in our workforce, BHP is 33, 34%. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. You look at Mark and you think, ah, yet another old white guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kid's description. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but if you knew Mark's story, you would understand that this man also came from very little. It doesn't matter the color of his skin but actually the story that Mark has of overcoming the challenges that he has, starting literally from the coalface to be arguably the most influential CEO in our industry, is also a story of inspiration for people who may think, well, how could I possibly do this? Because I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I didn't go to a public school. I don't have all these privileges. But until you have representation of people like Sonia for women who want to see a future of themselves in the mining industry, people of color who see themselves, who see other executives of color in the mining industry, it's very hard to say to people that there is opportunity for you here. And so that's why improving the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important, and why I've been really asking him to write a book, because the story that he has and the story of the few people that have really overcome adversity to become leaders in our industry must be told because we connect with human stories, and we don't have enough of those inspiring human stories yet 
to be able to look young people in the eye and say, it doesn't matter where you start from, you can get to the very top in our industry too. Thank you, Rob. It's uh, very inspirational. And on, on that, looking at att attracting people from diverse backgrounds um, outside of the mining industry, the younger generation, um, currently, in the mining industry in the US, there's going to be about 221,000 people retiring by 2029. Um, that's valuable knowledge, which will be lost if companies don't uh, find a way to bridge a generational gap. Sonia, where should mining companies be looking for new talent, and how do you think the mining industry rates as an employer relative to other sectors? We heard Mark uh, talking about uh, how people see the mining industry, so the rating is probably very low. And thanks Ro, for uh, talking about the diversity. I actually reckon that uh, often I'm looking like me, only me in the room. Um, so there isn't the diversity we need. I, um, I believe that there are uh, two main things uh, that the mining industry has to do looking forward. First of all, uh, is uh, thinking about uh, not just what are uh, the talent uh, out there, but uh, what the talent look like. Tendentially, we always go to the same uh, uh, group of people uh, with the same uh, group of capabilities. I think uh, that's we need to expand the search uh, to outside uh, the classic uh, mining industry sector uh, or mining background. That's uh, is the first step. Then uh, the. The industry needs not just to hire people, uh, and it's not the retention of people, but it's the development of people. We don't put uh, enough effort uh, and enough emphasis on developing people and developing their career. The reason why BHP has achieved the 33% uh, of a female is not just uh, through hiring and retaining, but it's through proper development and coaching. And I benefit of that, I must admit. Um, I haven't been told uh, you are too young, you are a woman, or anything like that. I've been provided the support that I needed, and I don't come from a mining background. My background is not mining, so there is this component of taking risk on people that have different background. So with that, going back to what, what is the, the future task force we are looking, it is not uh, the, the task force we have today. The mining industry needs to uh, change uh, on what is expected from us to deliver in the next uh, 20, 30 years. So people that we're bringing in today, they have to come in with a more creative, innovative mindset. They have to come from parallel in industries, whether it's uh, oil and gas, but also from uh, universities they train on uh, um, technology, innovation, uh, whether it's AI, machine learning. We need to bring in those type of talents. It's not just uh, geologists and engineers, and I'm sorry for all geologists and engineers in the room, I'm a geologist as well. But we need to look at other talent. My new head of portfolio, she used to work for Coca-Cola. She used to do innovation and strategy in Coca-Cola, not mining background. So we need to be open to, to look differently at what are the, the talent out there, and then develop people internally. So that's, I think, uh, is going to be key, and it's also going to be key to attract people. Uh, if we are offering the people uh, a boring career, uh, that they're going to do the same job over and over again, uh, and there is no opportunity for growth, uh, then we are not going to be able to hire the right talent. Uh, we heard before on the talk, uh, talk about uh, attention span in TikTok. Uh, I never want to talk about attention span, and the new generation have a short attention span. Uh, I, I don't think that's true new generation live in a society that we move much faster and we do everything much faster and telling to people you need to take three to five years on this role to be ready for the next role it's not the right approach anymore that level of conservatism the level of thinking has to go we need to take risk we need to develop people we need to accelerate people and finding meaningful work to do they can make an impact the reason why i decided to go to mining for me wasn't for how I seen the mining industry, which is, uh, as he described, dirty, conservative, obsolete. I decided to go to mining because uh, where we are today with the energy transition and the needs, I believe I can make an impact. I, can, I believe that I can actually change something from within and from outside. And that's what we need to communicate to people externally if we want to bring talent in, is the impact that it can make. Thank you. Ross, 
Different from, from the other three up here, your, your background is, is investment into mining companies and uh, quite often acquiring leadership teams. What, how does RCF support companies in which it takes an equity position in uh, with their hiring processes? Yeah, so let me start by first talking a little bit about some of the earlier questions from my perspective. Growing up in the United States, and I think this applies to kids growing up in the UK or in, in Europe, um, you don't get good exposure to mining. So um, as a young kid growing up in, even in Arizona, which is mining prolific, we didn't hear much about the mining industry. Uh, and what you did hear was quite negative. So attracting young people into mining was always a challenge because it had this negative perception. My kids growing up, um, when they were in high school, their textbooks, their science textbooks, were very, very negative on mining. They had all this material about uh, environmental disaster. And so, so I've tried to preach to my kids the, the virtues and the value of mining. My father was a professor of metallurgical engineers, so I, so I was exposed to mining at an early age from that. Uh, and he always said it's a noble industry, one we can be proud of and one we can uh, be proud of talking about. And I think that's the narrative that has to change, is that it is a noble industry, it is a, a valuable industry. What I do today is I, I manage a private equity fund. As, as Rowan indicated, we've invested in over 200 different mining companies over a 25-year history. And, and without fail, every one of our successes and failures within the, that massive portfolio had to do with leadership. It had to do with whether or not we had the right people in the job. And so originally, we would always talk about hiring a good metallurgist, a good geologist. Um, Today we are looking at, at who is the best person for that job. It doesn't necessarily have to be a technical person. It can be a commercial person. It can be somebody from a processing, from a chemical, the chemical world. Um, it's really identifying the skills that are needed to be successful in that particular project. What we do when we go into a new investment is we do a skills matrix. And the matrix looks at what, what capability is on the, on the management team as well as the board of directors and what skills are lacking. And then we go out and recruit for those skills that are needed. And I would say in probably 90% of the investments we make, we enhance the management teams. I use the word enhance because we don't necessarily change people out, but we'll bring in a project manager, or we'll bring in a, a, a commercial person, a marketing person that can really help that investment succeed. And so over, over 25 years of doing this, we've, uh, you know, again, we've experienced that, the, that management is critical and, and the right people in the right job is critical. And so it, uh, it plays very well into what we're talking about today. It's spot on. And, and what do you think the potential consequences of, of, uh, of failing to attract an ample supply of talent leading up to 2050 will be um, from your perspective? Well, look, you know, when you look at all the supply and demand uh, uh, charts, we're in a massive need for metals and minerals. Uh, and I've, somebody coined the phrase that every metal and, and mineral is critical. Uh, if, if we don't have those metals and minerals, there's no way we're going to achieve the, the decarbonization goals, the energy transition goals. So we've got to attract people. I, having a background in economics, I, I like to think that the market will drive the supply of people to our industry, but, but in fact, it's more than that. We've got to change the perception of mining. That whole narrative that people view mining with a negative uh, perception is more than just market driven. It, it, it means that we've got to go out and really explain the virtues of mining, not what mining does, but what mining provides. And I think it's really critical that we focus on what does mining provide. So when I think about our investments, you know, we invest within RCF with a five-year time horizon. We're thinking, you know, when we make an investment, we're looking to exit in five years. So we, you know, we're looking in that horizon. But when we think more globally about the mining industry, thinking out to 2050, we've got to be preparing people today for those jobs in 20, 30 years. And, and, uh, and so we've got to do a better job of, of recruiting people at the high school level to go into mining. Um, I'll just mention quickly, I'm involved at the University of Arizona in Tucson with uh, the Lowell Institute for Natural Resources, and it's, uh, it's created a multidisciplinary approach to mining, and they've just started up a new college of mines there that takes mining students and puts them through curriculum in the medical school, for example, to deal with health and safety, in the agriculture school to talk and, and learn about what's happening in reclamation, how do you reclaim a mine at the end of the mine life. 
um, they go through the, through the legal school to talk about contracts and, and security of title. I love that approach because I think it's important to expose people to the fact that mining doesn't just talk about digging holes and processing. It, it's much more encompassing. And I think what they're doing there is quite cutting edge. Thank you. <clears throat> Ro, who do you think the right people are and the right messengers to reach young people to share messages a better sector in order to achieve that 2050 goal? I think it comes back to Mark's point about uh, creating the space for people to want to be and then be able to be curious. So we don't get to select the messengers. That's the point we have to understand. As much as we would wish for certain people to say good things about us, we're not going to, it would be wrong for us to try and influence people to do that. What we, the best we can do is create environments in which people are genuinely curious about what we do, and through that, they will learn themselves and then become ambassadors if they're so motivated to do so. It comes back to a basic fact of human nature. Nobody, nobody can change your mind but you on any matter. Think about it. When have you last changed your mind because you heard an industry association or a mining company tell you something? I'm just going to use the example of plastics. I've had the plastic industry tell me that if my banana wasn't wrapped in plastic as it is in supermarkets, that banana would rot three days sooner and there'd be more food waste. Do you think that makes me feel better about plastics? <laughs> that makes me feel worse. Because now I'm complicit in the plastic waste that I think the world suffers from. And so if I'm, if I'm trying to decide whether how I feel about plastics between the, the data I've been provided and then the image of a whale cut open with its stomach filled with plastic, I'll tell you where my mind automatically goes. Whereas if the plastic industry was to create the space to have those kind of conversations more openly, I'd be much more curious about seeing how plastic can be more sustainable. I think that's the best shot we have to create the kind of ambassadors that will spread the message. I just want to build on something else Mark said about how you pitched this when you described yourself as working for this industry that has the biggest net environmental impact positively. What, do people know that there is a company, a mining company in our industry out there whose purpose is to reimagine mining to improve people's lives? Isn't that a company that you would be willing to work for? Because reimagine mining means you recognize that mining has things that can be done better. But the reason you're doing it is to improve people's lives, right? And that company is Anglo, and it was under his leadership that Anglo developed that purpose. Now, it's one thing saying it, and people say, yeah, okay, yeah, so what? You said it. What does that actually mean? What that means is when we as an industry have struggled to build zero emission trucks, because that's what it's going to take to decarbonize mining, Anglo went and developed a hydrogen truck. You're not, you weren't at the time a, an OEM to build trucks, but you decided that if you're true to your purpose to reimagine mining to improve people's lives, you're not going to wait for others to solve that problem, you're going to do it yourself. It's by doing things like that that you then get ambassadors for the industry. It's not a PR campaign or anything even close to that. Thank you. On, on that, <clears throat> we can't choose the messengers, but it would be good to understand, Sonia, what, what you think the unique selling part points are um, for the mining industry in order to attract talent. And are there any distinct advantages and opportunities that companies within the sector can provide to their employees? I think as uh, he goes back to the example that, uh, that you do, is a hard, it's not what you say, but it's what you do. So for us, uh, when we started to change some of our activities, we have our first venture team three years ago, then we started to bring in people from Silicon Valley, we started to hire people from Innovation Center where they were coming from nuclear, uh, industry or they were coming from a, a parallel industries. So that's uh, where it started to demonstrate this interest uh, to open up and bring the external world in. When we ran uh, the, our first accelerator last year, uh, since then uh, we started to, to expose ourselves to a very completely different group of people. Uh, and we recently filmed a CBS documentary, Innovator uh, and Disruptor, and we were together with the Google, Amazon, uh, and then BHP. So that is when you start to do things, uh, they look different, uh, that uh, they, they start to, to show the interest to become uh, more uh, innovative, uh, more creative, uh, to open up the industry to a different way of thinking than where you start to attract the right talent, but also to retain your own employees. Because your own employees are going to see that your organization is willing to change, and to change a pace. It's not just a lip service, but it's demonstrating the interest and the intent to do something new. And then 
that paired with proper development and proper career plan, that's where you're sending a very clear message to your employees, they become your messenger, and to the external world, they see uh, how you're doing it. Until we don't do that, uh, it's no point to talk and talk between ourselves, which is not really helpful either. Great, thank you. Mark, you recently wrote a, a paper on when did minerals become a dirty word, which highlighted how the raw materials we mine are integral to nearly everything. Do you think we should explore this further and focus on mining supply chains and collaborations with youth-friendly brands such as Apple and Tesla? Yes, but if I take a step back, I think we have a broader context piece that we need to address together. And, and again, we're all scratching at the same pieces. Ro and I have had this chat. If you look at COVID, and the one thing that I think, well, the one thing that struck me in COVID is most people in responding to the issue and talking about isolation and shutting things down didn't actually understand how the world worked. So when I got a phone call and people have heard this story where we were told we're going to shut everything down, send people home. I said, are we allowed to keep the water running? Oh yes, of course you've got to keep the water running. I said, are we allowed to keep the lights on and keep the power station running? Oh, uh, yeah, well, we'll have to keep the, you know, so everything except the water, the power. And I said, food? Yeah, oh yeah, we'll have to keep delivering food. I said, fuel to keep power and everything. And, and I went, when I got to the sixth point, the minister said, oh, we got this wrong, haven't we? And I said, yeah, you think? <laughs> and, and, but, then we had a, but then we had a really, and he was, he was very good. He said, oh, he said, because he's so focused on trying to solve the issue. We then talked about how things work. And then we talked about business, government, and other play, key players for three days working together. And then the government and business and other players formed a partnership in designing how we should respond as a society. And in that context, mining then can be discussed in the context. I don't think, and this is one of the things I think we should all be trying to do, is upgrade social studies in schools, with teachers, with parents, and help people understand how today's world works. And as a natural consequence, people will then start to work out where mining fits because it'll be, fit, it'll be a discussion within the context of how everything works. And until we're able to set that framework up, I think we're gonna struggle in these conversations. As Rose said, you know, me lecturing you on agriculture and how we shrink uh, agricultural footprints and urban footprints because of mining, and the fact that mining is responsible for a doubling of areas available to biodiversity, nobody understands because they don't join all the other dots. So how do we be promoters of a much broader conversation that allows people to come to their own conclusion about our industry and where it fits? And I think we'll change the dialogue and we'll change the world in that conversation because we're in a very different conversation to those that we've been in on a much broader basis. And we should be part of that conversation. It's, it's really about doing, doing things different than what's been done in the past. Um, it'd be great to understand from, from all of you what, what you think mining should be doing differently than it has done in the past. Is, are there any key kind of things that pop up? Well, look, I think the one thing is getting the message out. So it's, it starts, I think, at a grassroots level. I think uh, getting people from the mining industry into the classrooms, talking about the, the values and virtues of mining. Um, my daughter is a school teacher and I go in and, and it, she's a fourth grade school teacher and I do these gold panning uh, uh, exercises with the students and it's just something fun but it actually you start talking about well what in the room is is mined versus grown and and you just start getting these young kids thinking about it at the high school level I think there's a great opportunity for us to go into those classrooms and start changing the dialogue and really uh, so so look I think it, it starts at the grassroots level um, in Colorado, where I live, there's ads on TV for the oil and gas industry, but you'll never see an ad for mining, uh, and nor would I expect to, but I think that, that somehow mining has to get its, its word out about what we're doing positively, and I think there's a great opportunity to do that. When I look at what's happened with the IRA in the U.S., with, uh, with this whole critical minerals and energy transition metals, 
all of a sudden people are talking about metals and mining and the importance of it. Let's capitalize on that. Let's make sure people realize that, gosh, this is a fantastic opportunity for people not only to be in this industry, but also to talk about the good that this industry does, the fact that the energy transition does not occur without metals and mining. So I think we're given a great opportunity to, to capitalize on it right now. That's it. Yeah. Um, I think actually what we'll need to do in the future is to work with and through people we wouldn't normally have thought we would need to work with and through. And I wonder if you could quickly tell the story of the faith engagement. Um, in 2010, um, we were in a debate with a, a number of mining companies and we talked about how we could make an impact on our industry as a very positive impact and improve all the things we did. And we talked about mining technologies, what are the things we could collaborate on. And it was always a difficult conversation. But then we talked sustainability and what we might do together. And we talked about stakeholders. And I was in a, I, I, I gave a speech in uh, Brazil and I said that when you look in Africa in particular, it was when I was at Anglo Gold Ashanti, and I said, in every community that I've been in where we've been in the mining or about to develop a mine, very little government infrastructure very little business infrastructure, very little infrastructure in terms of bringing people together, there's always a church. So I said, what we've learned is that by engaging with the local church, their convening power, their ability to bring people together and talk about what we were looking to do, and by asking, not saying you need, but asking them about what they want their community to look like in 5, 10, 20 years, it's a very different dialogue about what we do in terms of how we can be a partner in the community and help them create the community they want to, 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 to um, create. And Key Vecker was a great example. The round table, 18 months, 26 projects, and they were the community's projects. Delivered on time, on budget, not because we were good or bad managers, it's because the community supported us and it was their project in Peru where many projects had been stopped. So the faith-based community the conversations was about becoming strategic. And I said, if we were thinking strategically, we'd go to the Vatican. And Ray Oppenheiser put his hands up and he was the Oxfam representative at the, at the uh, session and said, oh, that would be Cardinal Turkson, who's in charge of peace and justice. So we tootled off to see Cardinal Turkson. And he said to us, what do you want? And I said, we want to understand. I don't want anything. I don't want you to sign off saying we're good guys or bad guys. I'd like to understand what we could do better. And that morphed into day of reflection, ICMM members at the, the sessions. And we had all of the major church groupings, Catholic, uh, Anglican, Methodist, um, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu represents a whole range of people. And Christine Lagarde in one of our sessions said, how did you think of getting this people? I told the story. But she said, what, why? And I said, well, this group here represents 30% of the world's population. It's not a bad place to start a different type of dialogue around what we do. Now, as Rose said, lecturing the faith-based groups wasn't going to work. We took them to mind sites, we helped them understand what we do, and we changed the conversation. Now, ultimately, the test is, did it work? The Archbishop of Canterbury, press statement after doing this for five years, said, we've been researching the Bible for the last five years. We've not been able to find one negative reference to the mining industry. Therefore, we conclude, if it's done responsibly, we can support mining. And as I said to Adam Matthews, who you saw earlier, it took us 2,000 years to get that statement from a church to support our industry. Mm -hmm. But the point was, it's about engaging stakeholders mm -hmm. and taking them through the journey. And ultimately, it only means something if they're talking about you, it's not you talking about your own story. Maybe if I can add to that uh, with a slightly different angle, uh, I think also we need to change how we communicate. Uh, it's not just to whom we communicate. We're used to communicating in a very standard way when we think about, uh, look at Instagram, uh, including my company, our, web pa our page look like, it's boring. It doesn't talk to people, sorry. And uh, it, it doesn't, it's not exciting, it's not uh, um, inspiring. It, it, we just are not good at communicating and communicating in a different way in different platform. 
we go in conferences, there are uh, mining conferences for mining people. So as I said before, we told to ourselves, uh, we need to uh, a little bit branch out. We need to, to be outside of our, of our comfort zone and talk to people and be very comfortable when uh, we get pushed back, be very comfortable when we get told that mining is dirty. So how, how are you gonna listen? How are you gonna take ownership of that? Because mining hasn't been great in the past. We might change now, but it hasn't been great all the time. So how are we changing that by listening and communicating and then going more to a platform that we are not used to and do things differently? I, um, I was invited to the World Climate Summit uh, next week in Dubai to give a speech. That for me would have been one of the first times the BHP speak on one of these events where they are not miners. That's it. That is the place where we have to start to and start to, again, we, we can't change people's mind, but we can definitely interact and talk to people and, and listen to what they have to say. That has to be together with uh, what we are doing. That's, thank you very much, everyone. I think, um, conscious of time, it'd be really great to, to get some Q&A from, from the audience. There should be a mic floating around. It'd be great to hear from students or anyone. Are you a student, if so, can we go to you first? Yeah. <laughs> We're just kind of keen to get as many questions from students as well. Um, hi, I'm Taz Neum from University of St. Andrews. I just kind of wanted to ask that, you know, it's easy to joke with our, our generation that we're this TikTok generation and, you know, all, all this, our attention span is that of a goldfish. But in truth, what we don't want to see is the mining industry just contacting us with a well choreographed dance or a personalized message by Taylor Swift. What we want to see is actual change, right? We want to see action happening within the industry. We've grown up seeing the 2020 targets. We've grown up seeing the 2030 targets. We're now talking about 2050 targets. We're already starting the conversation about 2070 targets. But we're here because we want to be part of an industry that makes change, that actually can be part of that. Do you think that companies, as a body that can perhaps be held more accountable than the industry as a broad term, truly understand that when they're trying to get younger people into the workforce? I can pick on this. Uh, uh, look, I think the, the company, and I talk about my company, understand that, uh, understand the need of change and understand the need to bring in the talent to help with that change. We are facing something that we haven't faced in the past, so we don't have the answers. That is the reality. And we are looking to, for people to come in and help to give these answers. Uh, it is a risk uh, that both who comes in as well as us uh, we need to take. Uh, so my ask is uh, try, come and help. Uh, if you don't try, you never do. Like, I, I've been called a change agent, uh, my company a disruptor. I'm annoying most of the time, my team will tell you, but you got to try. That is, and if you have that uh, passion, why not? Right. I, I was asked a similar question, um, and it's, it's the right question. If I'm being brutally honest, my guess is 30% of the industry really is committed to change. You're going to have to make a judgment call on who that 30% might be in terms of what they say and what they do. I would guess 20 to 30% aren't doing the right things and there's a group in the middle that are following and, and moving with the breeze. So who are the leaders? Who would you want to work for? Do your homework and make the decision on based on what you see and I think those that would inspire you are the ones that would interact and try and take your points into account and interact constructively. That's the decision you've got to make, because we've still got a long way to go, and I think we're the first ones to recognise we've got a long way to go as an industry and as individual companies. Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm actually, I'm, hi, I'm Will. Uh, thank you very much for that fantastic panel, first of all. Um, I do work for ICMM, I promise I will be placed here as a senior. <laughs>
discussion today, we've talked a lot about the fantastic changes in the industry. Um, and I'm a believer in that and the agency that we have in the industry. But there are also bad stories with mining. And I think part of the issue with the new um, uh, is a lack of acceptance, perhaps, of those bad stories. So how do you believe we can balance the bad stories and accept the past almost, but also then drive the future? <laughs> You and I need to have a chat after this. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I have, let me be really, really open with all of you. I have been criticized by my peers in the industry for talking too much about the bad stories. Because I fundamentally believe that you have no hope of building trust with somebody unless you are willing to face up to the bad stuff, especially stuff that's important to them. We have this horrible habit as an industry, but it's not unique to us, of engaging in whataboutism. So somebody will come and challenge one of us and say, what about your record on water pollution? And we say, yes, he says, but what about all the jobs we create and all the taxes we pay? Because we want to talk about this because it's a good story and deflect away from this. That is the worst thing you can do if you're really serious about building trust. I would go as far as to say that in most conversations, lead with the bad stuff because let's them talk about it, and then you might feel psychologically safe and interested and curious enough to find out about the good stuff. But I've been told, well, stop just kind of beating ourselves up, and time for that is over, and let's look forward, and let's, I mean, even from personal life, that is not how you repair relationships. It, I, so I, maybe I'm too much on the other side, but I fundamentally believe that as an industry, We've got to be far more comfortable talking about some of the bad stuff. And I've said this publicly, and I'll say it again, even though I know, again, I'll be criticized for it. I cannot see a future in which this industry builds broad-based trust without some form of truth and reconciliation for what has happened in the past. I don't know what form that needs to take, and trust me, I come from a country where truth and rec reconciliation was not perfect, South Africa. But it was an essential part of transitioning from institutional racism to democracy. I think our sector needs some form of truth and reconciliation. Yeah, okay, hi there, I'll try and make this one quick. Um, I'm also a student, student from Southampton, and in line, similarly with the other student's question from St. Andrews, um, something I feel like I've gauged and some of the other students have gauged here is there's a real need for skills in this industry, um, be that with the emerging way technology is gonna change the workforce, or with the countless emerging issues that we're experiencing with the environment. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to ask what responsibilities are you guys on the panel taking and other mining companies taking or the chiefs of those mining companies taking to enable that upskilling that we're kind of seeing is going to be really important for the future? Thank you. Ross, do you want to? I'm happy to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing there. We've uh, recently, not recently, maybe five years ago, created a data analytics group within our firm. Uh, and we have this incredible talent of people that are coming, have come in and uh, let me back up. The one thing great about mining is that we collect tremendous amounts of data. There's data on everything. What we don't do well is we don't analyze the data. We haven't really looked at how to best utilize the data. So taking a data analytics group that's completely unrelated to mining to sort all this data out and figure out how to use it has been eye-opening and has allowed us to be much more productive in some of our minds. Um, that's just a small slice of some of the things we do. You know, we, we look at all sorts of new technologies. We have a technology and innovation fund embedded within our platform. And seeing some of the new technologies and innovations, people that are completely unrelated to mining, um, whether it's bacterial leaching that, that happens as an offshoot of work that they're doing in biochemistry, um, the skills are, are across the board that can apply to mining. And so what I'd say is, you know, we're, we are trying to be as open-minded as we possibly can coming from an industry that's been, I think, fairly narrow-minded in the past and, and opening these, you know, this broad spectrum of what's out there and what's new and capable. You know, when you look in Perth at some of the data or some of the uh, control centers that are operating mines remotely up in the Pilbara, a thousand kilometers away, it's mind-boggling. And it's, you know, the people that are in those control centers uh, come from a generation that have worked with computers and have worked with, uh, Xboxes or whatever that, that are all of a sudden fantastic at, uh, at doing mining from a remote center a thousand miles away, a thousand kilometers away. Wow. I think that has been an absolutely fantastic panel session. 
Um, really, really great questions from the audience as well. Can we please give the audience for us some great questions, but also the panelists and also the moderator for an absolutely fantastic session. Many, many thanks. Thank you.